Crime and Crime Again discusses true crime content that may be graphic or disturbing. Listener discretion is advised. This episode discusses topics that may be triggering, including sexual assault and suicidal ideation. Ebby Jane Stepick was born on March 31, 1997, and grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas with her two siblings. She was a talented makeup artist who had dreams of going to cosmetology school, and she had also explored the possibility of obtaining her real estate license. One of Ebby's favorite places on earth was the beach. She loved collecting seashells and gifting them to family and friends. A kind-hearted soul, Ebby was protective and compassionate, especially with her loved ones. Quote, she was always able to make people feel good about themselves, end quote. One of her friends, Brittany, said in an article by Arkansas Online, Ebby was an absolute spitfire, and it seems as though everyone who knew her loved this about her. She had a comedic personality and loved to laugh. Ebby's mother, Lori, said in an article by THV11, quote, she was very funny. She would not let you leave a room without making you laugh, end quote. With that fiery personality came a strong desire for independence, and Ebby pursued that adamantly. In the fall of 2015, when Ebby was 18 years old, she had made the decision to transfer away from the private school she had attended since her freshman year of high school, and instead wanted to attend Central High School in Little Rock for her senior year. That summer, she had also landed a job at a footlocker store at a nearby mall, These life changes also brought noticeable changes to Ebby's social life and behavior. She had begun spending a lot of time with new friends, and even started telling little white lies to her parents about where she was going and who she was with. Of course, this is pretty typical behavior for teenagers, especially when they're right on the cusp of leaving high school and entering adulthood. It brings about an intense urge for freedom. But it wasn't just Ebby's parents who were becoming concerned with the changes in their daughter's behavior. One of Ebby's closest friends, Danielle, also noticed the path that Ebby was treading and made a concerted effort to steer her friend away from potentially questionable or dangerous situations. In an article by Arkansas Online, Danielle said, quote, I was like, Ebby, that's not safe. Don't do that. Ebby, that's not a good position. Don't put yourself in that. End quote. Within the first few weeks of her senior year, Ebby's new school contacted her parents to let them know that she had been missing several classes. As a result of her truancy, her grades also began to slip. At home, it seemed that Ebby was becoming more and more combative with her parents, and she was unhappy living under their roof. Her relationship with her parents became contentious and argumentative. Gradually, it became more common for Ebby to seek refuge at Danielle's house after fighting with her parents. After one argument in particular, Ebby's parents gave her an ultimatum, be respectful or leave, and being as independent as she was, Ebby chose to leave. Initially, she moved in with her older brother, Trevor, though she would move around between his house, her grandparents' house, and friends' houses. Ebby again missed school on October 21st, 2015, which was a Wednesday. That morning, she had made plans to take Danielle to her school. However, Danielle's doctor's appointment that morning would have made Ebby late to school, so Danielle insisted that Ebby go on to her school and she would get to school another way. In response to Danielle's text message, Ebby replied, quote, No, it's not a big deal at all. I really didn't want to go to school today anyway because there's all that drama. End quote. Danielle told Arkansas Online that she was not sure what drama Ebby was referring to. They were attending different schools, so it's entirely possible that there were things happening at Ebby's school that Danielle wasn't aware of. On the night of Friday, October 23, 2015, Ebby attended what was described as a small party where she did take part in smoking cannabis, but it's unclear whether or not she had consumed any alcohol. It was at this party that Ebby alleged in a text message to a friend that she had been sexually assaulted by four men, and that her assault had been recorded on at least one of the men's cell phones. In those text messages, Ebby named the four men and allegedly expressed thoughts of suicide. The next day, October 24, 2015, Ebby texted her stepfather Michael, telling him about the sexual assault the night before. 
She asked him if he would go with her to the police to report it. Michael agreed and attempted to make arrangements to meet Ebby, but she never responded. Cell phone records show that on that same day, Ebby made two calls to the Little Rock police, each about a minute long. Police later claimed to have no record of these phone calls. Ebby's cell phone records also revealed that she had sent text messages to the men she alleged had sexually assaulted her. In those messages, she was threatening to go to the police if they didn't send the video to her and delete it from their phones. For the rest of that day, no one heard anything else from Ebby. On October 25th, around 5.30 p.m., she called her brother Trevor. She sounded disoriented and confused. Alarmed, Trevor asked her where she was, and she told him that she was in her car, right outside of his house. But when he looked outside, Ebby wasn't there. Attempting to press her for more information, Trevor tried to find out who she was with, but Ebby sounded out of it, completely unaware of her surroundings. She told Trevor, quote, I'm fucked up, end quote, and then she hung up the phone. Immediately, Trevor tried to alert the police that he felt his sister was in danger, but they shrugged off his concerns and concluded that Ebby was likely just a runaway. When the family tried to report Ebby as a missing person, Little Rock police told them that they would have to wait 12 hours. Once again, this is not true. They were finally able to report Ebby missing on October 26, 2015. Despite the family's report, police were unconvinced that Ebby had met with any harm. They still believed her to be a runaway. Family and friends spent the days after Ebby disappeared handing out flyers and searching for her on their own. Just a few days after Ebby was last seen, a security guard alerted police to an abandoned car in Shalomont Park, just three miles away from Ebby's parents' home. On October 30th, 2015, police confirmed that the abandoned Volkswagen Passat was indeed Ebby's car. The battery was dead, the gas tank was empty, and the key was still in the ignition. Ebby's phone, wallet, and contacts were left in the front seat, and her expensive makeup was strewn around the car, damaged and broken. Within days of the discovery of her car, one of Ebby's friends, Kaylee, and her mother, Margie, went to investigate the area around where the car was found. Immediately, they noted the distinct smell of decomposition in the vicinity and informed police. But once again, they were dismissed. It wasn't until after the discovery of her car that authorities launched searches for Ebby. Soon after the start of the investigation, authorities discovered surveillance footage that showed Ebby's car traveling on Cantrell Road in West Little Rock, but never released further details about where exactly the car was spotted or whether she was traveling alone. During the investigation of Ebby's car, police had left the trunk of the car open, and heavy rains had swept through the area. Lori noted that she was frustrated with how the police appeared to be mishandling her daughter's case. In November 2015, Ebby's family put up a $3,000 reward for information leading to her whereabouts. Little Rock police claimed that the four men who Ebby alleged had sexually assaulted her at a party were questioned about her disappearance. However, there was no investigation conducted regarding the sexual assault and their cell phones were never searched for evidence of the video. The search for Ebby Stepik went cold. In November 2016, one year after Ebby disappeared, Authorities returned to Shalomont Park with cadaver dogs, attempting to locate any trace of her. The searches were unsuccessful. Authorities once again brought in cadaver dogs in May 2017, but these searches again yielded no evidence as to Ebby's whereabouts. In June 2017, the family increased the reward to $50,000 for information leading to Ebby's whereabouts. Later in 2017, Lori hired private investigator T.J. Ward, who had previously worked on the Natalie Holloway case. However, within a few months, the family had parted ways with Ward. In February 2018, Lori filed a complaint against the Little Rock Police Department. She alleged that multiple officers, including a captain, a lieutenant, and a sergeant, had sent her threatening text messages, were verbally aggressive and accusatory during questioning, and had little to no contact with her during the start of the investigation. Lori was able to provide ample evidence of these claims, including recordings of conversations, emails, and witnesses. Lori took her complaint up to Internal Affairs, who later claimed that they found no evidence of mistreatment in the investigation. The officers in question have since left or been transferred out of the Major Crimes Unit. Sometime in 2018, 
Cold case detective Tommy Hudson had been assigned to Ebby's case, and the FBI soon became involved as well. In May 2018, Tommy Hudson returned to Shalomont Park, citing a gut instinct that urged him to search the area again. The FBI sent cameras into a drainage pipe just a few feet away from where Ebby's car had been found two and a half years prior. The cameras hit obstructions in the pipe from two different entrance points, and this encouraged investigators to begin excavating. On May 22, 2018, human remains were found in this drainage pipe in Shalomont Park. They were confirmed to be the remains of Ebby Stepik. She was found just 60 feet away from where her car was left abandoned. It is believed that she was there the entire time she was missing. Ebby's cause of death has never been released to the public. Up to this point, there have been no further updates in Ebby's case, and Tommy Hudson has remained tight-lipped about the details of the investigation. He has confirmed that the investigation into Ebby's murder remains active and open. If you have any information regarding the murder of Ebby Stepik, please contact the Little Rock Police Department at 501 501- 371-4829. If you enjoy the show, please do consider leaving a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts as it really, really helps out with the visibility of the show. If you don't listen on Apple Podcasts but you would still like to leave a review, you can do that on Podchaser by searching Crime and Crime Again. I will also link it in the show notes. If you'd like to show monetary support for the show, you can do so on Buy Me a Coffee where you can make a one-time donation less than the price of one cup of coffee. I will also leave that link in the show notes. You can follow the podcast on Twitter at Crime Again Pod, Instagram at Crime Again Podcast, on Facebook, Crime and Crime Again Podcast, and on TikTok at Crime Again Podcast. There is also a Facebook discussion group, which I will link in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you in the next episode of Crime and Crime Again.